with that, we're going to be looking today here in Mark chapter 9. And uh, I chose simply to entitle this an introduction to the tribulation. I'm going to give to you a lot of information, context, so we can see what Jesus is speaking about here in verses 9 through 13 of uh, Mark chapter 13. So I'll read to you verses 9 through 13. I'm going to give you a lot of backdrop because I'm not going to assume that every person here knows what's taking place in its context. And um, I think it's important to let you know some of these things. And then we can look at the verses before us. So beginning at verse 9, reading to verse 13. Jesus said, watch out for yourselves. For they will deliver you up to councils and you will be beaten in the synagogues. You will be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony to them. The gospel must first be preached to all the nations. But when they arrest you and deliver you up, do not worry beforehand or premeditate what you will speak. But whatever is given you in that hour, speak that, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. Now, brother will betray brother to death and father his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. So allow me to give you an introduction, lay a context for you. It's going to take a little while because I'm going to speak to you. I'm going to speak to you a little bit about this period of time called the tribulation because what we're looking at in these verses is speaking concerning the, uh, the time that Jesus is going to return. It's speaking of his second coming. Uh, we had seen that when it says in verse 3, as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign when all these things we will be fulfilled? And so Jesus and his men had just left the temple, the temple mount, it's called the temple mount there, and they'd gone to the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is just outside the city of Jerusalem. It's east of the city. And as he seated, as we just read, Peter, James, John, and Andrew approached him. They were disturbed to what he had just said because he had said in verse 2, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. So they're disturbed by what he had just said. You see, some of them had spoken concerning the beauty of that temple. And when they had done so, Jesus had responded and, and had told them that not one stone would be left upon another. He was saying to them that this beautiful temple that they were admiring so much and amazed at, well, he was saying this temple will be destroyed. So they had left that area. They had crossed the Kidron. They had come to Mount of Olives and they had been mulling in their mind what he had said. And so as mentioned, I just read this to you. As Jesus was, was seated, they approached him. Matthew tells us in chapter 24, verse 3, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? In Luke 21, 7, they asked him saying, teacher, but when will these things be? What sign will there be when these things are about to take place? So the question is a broader question, but they're, they're asking what's going to take place at the end of the age. So in answer to their question, Jesus outlined the events that are preceding his return. And we looked at this last time. He spoke of spiritual deception. He spoke of wars and earthquakes. He spoke of famines and plagues and that they were going to increase. In verse 8, he said that these things are only notice the beginnings of sorrows. That word sorrows is an interesting word. The word sorrow, when you look it up in the original language there, the New Testament being written in what is called koine or common Greek, the word sorrow speaks of acute pain or severe agony. The word sorrow is usually used to speak of birth pains. So these things, he said, will be escalating in intensity as birth pains do until his return. There'll be wars, there'll be earthquakes, there'll be famines, plagues, but they're only, he said, the beginning of sorrows. These are the clear indicators that there's going to be much more to come. <clears throat> and these things have continued. And as we've seen through history, have progressively worsened over the centuries. Now, I, I mentioned that this was the beginning of sorrows. In other words, this reveals that the period of time that he's speaking of is prolonged. From the time birth pains are first experienced to birth, 
Well, that can be several hours. I, I do remember when my wife Marie gave birth to our first child, her birth pains were 33 hours. And, and I learned to pray then. I, I remember my prayer. Thank God I'm not a woman. You know, that, that was 33 hours of intensity and all of that. Well, that's, what it, that's why they're called birth pains. It's an indication that a birth is, is, is about to occur, eventually will occur. So at this time, we are seeing much of what he had prophesied come to pass. Now, these things are indicators that his return is certain, that his return is not far off. Well, in these verses, Jesus begins giving what are called general conditions of the tribulation. And I'm going to begin our study with a brief overview of this time called the tribulation. I'm going to give you some information to develop a platform. The tribulation, some of you are aware of it, others are not. The tribulation is a seven-year period that God pours out His wrath on earth. His wrath is going to be poured out worldwide on those who reject Christ. When you read your Bible in the book of Revelation, chapter 6 through 19, there are details given of this seven-year period. Now, in Scripture, we refer to the tribulation or the great tribulation. That's how we normally speak of it. But in Scripture, the period is referred to in various ways. Jeremiah 30, verse 7, speaks of it as the time of Jacob's tr uh, trouble. In Daniel 9, 27, it's referred to as Daniel's 70th week. In Daniel 12, verse 1, it's called a time of distress. Matthew 24, verse 9, speaks of it as tribulation. Matthew 24, 21 says... It is great tribulation. 2 Peter 3.10 refers to it as the day of the Lord. In Revelation 3.10 is the hour of trial. So there are various ways that this seven-year period is referred to. There's tribulation. There's great tribulation. It's also called the wrath of the Lamb. In Revelation 6, verses 16 and 17, they called to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? So the tribulation is spoken of in both Old and New Testament. It's the final judgment of God on a Christ-rejecting world. Now, the church is not condemned along with those who have rejected Christ. This is not how the Lord works with the righteous. We have examples of that in Scripture. For example... When God judged the earth with a flood, he spared Noah and his family. 2 Peter 2 verse 5 says it like this. God did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others. When God judged Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham pleaded with him for his nephew Lot. And in Genesis 18.25, Abraham said to God, Far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And so the tribulation. The tribulation is when God pours out his wrath on unbelievers. Now, some have a hard time believing that God has wrath. I remember I used to teach a, a Bible study on occasion in, uh, in uh, Montclair, and uh, I was an assisting pastor at that time, and so I went to the Montclair High School, and there was a, a Christian club, and I still remember sharing out the wrath of God, and a young man approaching me and telling me, my pastor says that, that there is no such thing as wrath of God, and some have a hard time believing that God has wrath. The word wrath speaks of something that is violent. It's a violent, justifiable passion. It speaks of judgment, and wrath is God's settled displeasure with man's sinfulness. In John 3, 36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. In Romans 1, 18, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. And so there is such a thing as the wrath of God. He does pour his wrath out, and he judges unbelievers, but he spares those who have been saved by Jesus. His wrath has been satisfied through the sacrifice of Christ for us. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5, verse 9, since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? 
And so the tribulation is time of God pouring out his wrath, and it occurs between the rapture and the second coming of Jesus Christ. Again, God didn't appoint us to wrath, so he removes the church before the tribulation. Now, Paul wrote concerning this thing. Now, when I, when I was first saved, I had never heard this term. I had never heard of the rapture. Never heard that. And so when I first got saved, I went to Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa, and I began to hear studies that related to this event called the rapture. The rapture is, uh, is when the Lord removes the church, and it occurs um, before the second coming of Christ. It, becomes, it, come, it, it occurs before the tribulation. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17, it, it says, The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of an archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. So when he says those who are alive and remain shall be caught up, the word caught up is harpazo, and it means to be seized suddenly, to be taken quickly. And that's a picture of the rapture that we're going to be pulled quickly out of this place. And so that's going to happen. God is going to seize us eagerly and remove us. Now, that happens before the tribulation. A third thing about it, it's going to be a time that is characterized by unrestrained human evil. You see that in verses 12 and 13 in this chapter. Brother will betray brother to death, father his child. Children will rise up against parents, cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. He who endures to the end shall be saved. It's going to be a time of uh, unrestrained human evil. In Matthew 24, 12, uh, he said, Because iniquity will abound, the love of many will wax cold. So evil will be the norm during that time as the tribulation continues. The tribulation is, time, is the time of Israel's greatest suffering. In Matthew 24, 21, it says, Then there will, be a, uh, there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. In the Old Testament book of Zephaniah, chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hastens quickly. The noise of the day of the Lord is bitter. There the mighty men shall cry out. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of devastation and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Malachi 4.1 says, Behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven. All the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. It is going to be a time of great suffering. It lasts seven years from the signing of a treaty between Israel and a figure that is called the Antichrist. In Daniel 9, 27, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. That would be a week of years, seven years. But in the middle of the week, in the th three and a half year mark, in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. Now, Antichrist begins as a political leader who is ruling the world. In Revelation 13, verse 3, it speaks of those who, who wonder after the, the beast. The whole world is wondering after the beast. For the first three and a half years, he's going to keep a low profile. He's going to gather strength. He begins as Israel's ally. Ultimately, he'll betray their confidence. Now, part of the covenant that we read about that will be drawn up during this seven-year period, part of that covenant will be granting permission to rebuild the temple. You see, when you go to Israel to this day, you can go to what is called the Temple Institute. We go there, we've gone there for many years. The Temple Institute, they have uh, the different kinds of implements that will be used in temple sacrifice. They even have the high priest garments ready, the crown and everything ready. There's a, a mezuzah, a large mezuzah that's uh, standing just outside that is all part of what's going to take place in the rebuilt temple. The Jews have already determined that they want to rebuild that temple. That temple will be rebuilt. The Bible makes it very clear that it will. The temple has to be rebuilt. Now, we know that the temple was destroyed under Titus of Rome. We know that that took place. 
But when you're reading your Bible here, it makes it very clear that the temple will have been rebuilt. Notice verse 14. We'll look at that in detail next time. But it says, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing where it ought not, let the reader understand, let, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. That's in reference to the temple that will be rebuilt. So there are questions related to that. How is that going to take place? Seeing that it doesn't exist now, and the Dome of the Rock is there on, on the Temple Mount, and, uh, and yet the Scripture, Jesus prophesies, necessitates that the Temple be rebuilt. It hasn't been standing for, for you know, hundreds and hundreds of years. How is that going to take place? Well, when we go to Israel, we go up this ramp, and we go into the area that is called the Temple Mount. When you go up into the Temple Mount, you will encounter the Dome of the Rock. The Dome of the Rock is there, and uh, we'll go and we, you'll look at it, and you don't go in or anything like that, but we'll see it. So we are not allowed to bring Bibles in. They will not allow us to bring our Bibles in. The Muslims have control over that, the Temple Mount, so they will not allow you to bring your Bible in. We actually leave our Bibles uh, in, our, in our backpacks, and all, or they won't let us go up. So we'll go up. And then we'll go up past the Dome of the Rock. And as we go past the Dome of the Rock, a little bit further on as we're entering in, as you're going up, um, off to the side, to the left side of the Dome of the Rock as we're approaching it to the north, there is something there, a small, uh, small uh, kind of like a cupola. It's, a, it's called the Dome of the Tablets and the Dome of the Spirits. So when you will walk past the Dome of the Rock, we go to this area, and then everybody who's on, on the tour with us will kind of form a, a wall for me. And so I'll have written out the scriptures that I'm going to read to you right now, Revelation 11, 1 and 2. And I'll read this. I was given a reed like a measuring rod, was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar. Count the worshipers there. But exclude the outer court. Do not measure it, because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months, three and a half years. And so we'll be standing there, and then people form this barrier, and I'll read the scripture. Now, there are people, there are guards that are watching. And so I usually bring John in case he comes to arrest us. I'll hand him the scriptures, and I'll say, I'll pray for you later on. I'll even try and bail you out. But they, uh, they're, they're watching you, and I'll read that scripture, and I'll say if you, and you've got to picture it this way, now I'm facing to the east, so the back doors are to the east. And off to my right here, to the south, is the Dome of the Rock. I'm standing in front of the Dome of the Spirits, or the Dome of the Tablets. And then I'll remind the people, or share with them, there was a, uh, an archaeologist, he's not the only one, uh, Asher Kaufman. But there are others, including my, my pastor, Chuck Smith, who believe that the Dome of the Spirits or Dome of the Tablet is the actual place where the Holy of Holies was because it's at a higher elevation than the Dome of the Rock. And so Asher Kaufman said, if you'll notice, and when we stand there, I'll point to this, I'll point in that direction, that's where the Eastern Gate is. The Eastern Gate is where they would enter in to go into the temple. The Eastern Gate is not lined up with the Dome of the Rock. The Eastern Gate is lined up with the Dome of the Spirit. And if we'll walk into that area, you'll look down and you'll see uh, the top of that gate because it's been buried in rubble for many centuries now. And so we'll give the study there and I'll say, look, this is how it's going to take place. At least this is how it appears. There needs to be a temple rebuilt. There will be a covenant sign between Antichrist and the Jewish nation. The Jewish nation desires their temple to be built. There are priests who are already, and have been, by the way, through the centuries, trained for temple sacrifice. That already exists. They already exist. They have a priesthood. Anybody whose name is Cohen in the Jewish religion, Cohen, if you know any Cohens, the word Cohen speaks of a priest. They have kept the lineage through their last names. I, we have some in our fellowship, Cohen. And, and I told him, I said, you're a descendant of the priests. That's what that name means. It speaks of the priests. And so the Kohen still exists, the Kohanim. They still exist. 
And so there's a, a, a group that are prepared and ready, have been trained for temple sacrifice. It's all ready. The only thing that is lacking at this moment is the rebuilt temple. Now, if Israel were to attempt to begin to build a temple, all of the Muslim armies of the world would descend on Jerusalem because to them that is a holy site. And the idea that the Jews should be there rebuilding a temple would not happen. But we know that the Antichrist comes and he's going to make a covenant. He's going to be the one who begins by bringing peace. There's going to be a treaty. And he's going to, we believe, I believe, he's going to make it possible for that temple to be rebuilt. Now, how's that going to happen? Well, if you look at the scripture, it says very very clearly, but exclude the outer court. Do not measure it because it's been given to the Gentiles. They'll trample on the holy city for 42 months. They're going to be able to rebuild the temple on its site and it can coexist with the Dome of the Rock. And so that has been excluded and that's what's most, most likely going to take place. There are other theories that perhaps a great earthquake will hit or whatever, but that's a very common belief. That's how it's going to take place. So, when the covenant is initially signed during this time, and again, all of this is just laying a foundation for the scriptures we're looking at. After the signing of the covenant, the tribulation begins. Now, this time period in scripture is distinguished from normal Christian pressures. Jesus in John 16, said, These things I've spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. That word tribulation flips this. It speaks of pressure, affliction. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. We have a normal amount of pressures we go through. But during the time of the tribulation, it begins three and a half years. It's called tribulation. Last three and a half years, great tribulation because it continues to ascend in intensity. And so these are the things that are the backdrop for the verses we're looking at. And so with verse 9, it says this, Watch out for yourselves, for they will deliver you up to councils. You will be beaten in the synagogues. You will be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony to them. So he begins to give them the overview. And he's beginning to give them general conditions. Now, the conditions can be summed up with one thought. Persecution will increase. The rejection of and hatred for God is going to be directed to Christians. During the tribulation, by the way, I've been asked this question, are people saved during the tribulation? Some think, some think no. No, but the Bible teaches otherwise, yes. Will there be Christians during the tribulation? Yes. Many will come to Jesus after the rapture. There are people who have heard the studies, they've heard the word, they've seen some of the movies and all, and they've just said, oh, no, that's, that's not true. That's just uh, Christian mythology. It's not going to happen, really. There are quite a number of people who've said that. There are, I've had someone tell me, well, I'm going to reject Jesus until the tribulation. I just want to see how bad it really gets. I said, well, you know, whatever. I mean, what can I say? There are actually people like that who really think that way. Let's see if it's true or not. Then I'm going to come to faith in Christ. No, you're not. If you can't come to faith in Christ when it's easy, you won't come to faith in Christ when it's hard. When you have to lose your head for your faith. But that's what people talk about. Will there be people saved? Yes. During the tribulation, a great amount will be will be, uh, will be saved. Revelation 7 speaks of a great multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and tongue. And they are before God's throne in white robes and they're worshiping. John is asked, who are these arrayed in white robes? Where did they come from? In Revelation 7, 14, John says, I said to him, my Lord, you know. He said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. You see, persecution has been part of the Christian life from the beginning. It is part of living lives that are intended to glorify God. And it's something that is guaranteed. 
There are so many people who will buy their little promise box, you know, their verses, and you can get them in your verse for the day, and you have 30 verses, and you take it out. You shall be the head, not the tail. Amen. Praise the Lord. This is my verse for the day. But what happens when you pick up 2 Timothy 3, 12? All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. That's a promise. So what do you do? You take it on. You say, man, I got my wife's promise for the day. I don't want to take away her blessing. You put it back. But that's a promise. It's one of his promises that is regularly fulfilled. And we're not to be surprised, by the way, when it occurs. It's part of the cost that is exacted for following Jesus. In 1 Peter 4, 12 through 14, Beloved, do not be surprised at the painful trial you're suffering, as though something strange were happening to you. Rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Listen, righteousness by its nature is confrontational. It's confrontational. It's not that you want to run around judging people, but our lives and the way that we live will actually produce conviction. And when you live for the Lord, well, it, it, it rises in contrast to those who don't. It just becomes obvious. And so sometimes the life that you live is actually revealing the evil of the life that somebody else may live. In Ephesians 5.11, Paul said it like this. He said, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather, he said, expose them. Now, there are times, of course, that just by teaching or sharing what God's word says, it's going to contradict what people hold fast to and think is okay. That happens. But also, as you're living those truths out as your daily life, and they see the way you live, by contrast in the way others are living, you can expose that too. You see, the response of the world will not always be positive. And the early church was very familiar with persecution. Somebody wrote, because of persecution... Suffering for Christ's sake was viewed as a privilege. God gave the gift of salvation, and he also bestowed the gift of suffering. In Philippians 1.29, Paul said it like this. He said, it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. The word grant is a word as a grace gift. It's been graciously given to you not only to believe, but also to suffer. So we're not to be surprised, even in our day, when people don't like us, don't want to eat lunch with us, or speak harshly of us. We shouldn't be surprised, because that's part of being a Christian. So in these verses, Jesus is referring to sources of persecution. Notice verse 9 again. He said, they will deliver you to councils, and you're going to be beaten in synagogues. One of the sources will be originating through uh, religious people, those who are religious. We see that in the, in the New Testament when the uh, early Christians were, were first persecuted by, by those of the Jewish faith who rejected Christ. You see, again, Christianity goes against common religious beliefs. Rejection of Christ is the acceptable faith for people in many ways, and so Christians are often attacked. I was in, Is in, rather, in India, and I've been there twice. I've spent an accumulation of about a month in, in India doing ministry, and, and I met somebody there. His name, was, they, his name was Moses Paulos. That was his name. And so when I came home, um, I, I had remembered him, and I received uh, word uh, of what had happened to him and his son, he had a young son, a young teen at, when I met him, and he had grown a bit older. It had been a, a few years since I had met and, and seen uh, Moses. But I'll never forget, a report came to me, and it was told, I was told that uh, Moses and his son were going from village to village in the region of India that they live in, and Moses had uh, gone into the village and uh, he had gone because he had been invited to by the elders of the village. They said, why don't you come in and share with us about this Jesus that you're preaching in all these villages? 
So Moses went in with his son. His son was his worship team drummer. He used to play this little bongo and all. That was his ministry. So he went with his father as a missionary into this village. When they went into the village, it, had, it was a setup. It was a trap. They wanted to torture him. And they took Moses and they took his young son. They tied him to a tree. Now in the center of the village, the oldest tree is where they go and make their sacrifices. Their, their, um, their pagan worship is at the ancient tree. So they took him to the ancient tree and tied him up. And they brought people with rods, these rods, the heavy, heavy rods, and they beat them so severely that the beating itself almost killed them. Then they sent for the village skinner. We don't understand what that is. Well, the village skinner is just that. It's a man who will skin you alive. He'll take your flesh off of you with a sharp knife. They sent for the village skinner to come and skin Moses and his son. But they couldn't find him. So Moses was let go. His kidneys were destroyed. He, he was hospitalized. His son was hospitalized with head injuries for several months. And then one day Moses said, I'm going back to the village. They need the Lord. This is the place that almost took his life. And he goes back. And when he came into the village, they were waiting. They saw him coming and they rushed to him. And he thought, it's over. And they said, we've been waiting for you to come back. We've been waiting for you to come back. Why is that? Because the tree, which was their ancient tree, the tree that they worship, it's like their temple, if you will, had died. After we tied you to this tree and beat you, the tree died. There's no reason it should have died. So we know your God is not pleased with us. We have to hear what you had to say. Moses led the elders and the entire village to faith in Jesus Christ through doing that. See, there's persecution. And you could, I know that if I were sitting out there hearing this story, I know that I'd be saying, yeah, that's right. Sure, of course, I don't believe that because I'm very skeptical. But I know the guy that this happened to. That actually did happen. And that village did turn to Jesus Christ. Persecution does occur. We know it occurs. Now, we've seen the videos of Christians kneeling on a beach where they're getting beheaded for their faith in Christ. That happened to this day, and it's intensely growing now, but it'll be even worse during tribulation. In John 16, 2 and 3, Jesus said, They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time comes that whoever kills you will think that he does God's service. And these things will and these things will they do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. There are a lot of religious people who put to death followers of Jesus Christ. It's happening to this day. He also goes on in verse 9, and he says, You will be brought before rulers and kings for my sake. Persecution will be initiated by governments. We know that to be a fact because during the time of the early church, Roman persecution was intense. Nero was slaughtering believers. Well, obviously, this occurs through governments up till this day. During the COVID lockdowns, automotive supply, cleaning services, tattoo parlors, and strip clubs remained open because they were deemed essential. Think about that for a minute. They were deemed essential, but churches were not. Churches were not regarded as essential. Religious faith in the United States now is disregarded, is not regarded. As a matter of fact, there are those who are openly saying that the Christian faith is something they want to eradicate. They don't like it. They don't like your faith. They don't like my faith. They don't. It's true. We know that. Churches were locked down. But Calvary Chapel San Jose under Pastor Mike McClure remained open, and it became the center of a legal battle. Calvary Chapel San Jose was fined $2.8 million for meeting. Mike was threatened and his assistant were threatened with jail. But this last August, a California appeals court dropped nearly $200,000 in fines, and prayerfully, the millions in fines will also be dropped. The Supreme Court has been clear that these orders violated the First Amendment and was clear discrimination against religion. Amen. Amen. To say that the government does not 
uh, frown on Christian, Christians, it's absolutely not true. It's absolutely not true. You will be persecuted, he says in verse 9, for his sake, for the sake of Jesus, not simply because of yourself. Again, we saw this happen in the early church's history, persecution by government. Acts chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, it was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. This persecution comes to full maturity during the tribulation. Verse 10 says the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Despite all the persecution, the gospel has been spread and continues being spread. In Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said, I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. It will not overcome it. And that's a fact. I mean, the, the church has marched triumphantly and continues to do so, has done so for 2,000 years with all of the oppression, all of the persecution, all of the hindrances. Why? Because the gates of hell cannot prevail against the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Jesus <laughs> told us that, and it's true. You see, during the tribulation, millions will be witnessing. They'll be sharing their faith. The whole world is going to hear. In Revelation 11, verse 3, it speaks of the two witnesses who will prophesy for three and a half years. In Revelation 14, 6 and 7, John says, I saw another angel flying in midair, and he has the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, Fear God, give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. So the word of God goes forth and during the tribulation continues doing so. In verse 11, he says, but when they arrest you and deliver you up, do not worry beforehand or premeditate what you will speak. But whatever is given you in that hour, speak that for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. This is something Jesus taught more than once. It happened throughout church history. It occurs during the tribulation. In Luke 12, 11 and 12, it says, when they bring you to the synagogues and magistrates and authorities, do not worry about how or what you should answer or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. In Luke 21, 14 and 15, settle it in your hearts not to meditate beforehand on what you will answer, for I'll give you a mouth in wisdom which all of your adversaries will not be able to contradict nor resist. So just trust in the Lord, saturate yourself in the word of God, during this period we're in now and into the tribulation later, there will be people who will answer because God has given them the words and wisdom. That's what happens. What you do is you soak yourself in God's word and then God provokes you and draws out of you that answer in those circumstances. That's why it's very important for us to stay in the word daily, to read, to know, to be able to study, to be aware. So we, out of the abundance of our heart, our mouth will speak. The Holy Spirit will prompt us and give us words and wisdom that our enemies will neither gainsay nor resist. He goes on in verse 12, brother will betray brother to death and a father is child. Children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. Your family, your family can be a source of persecution. Your own family. I remember when Marie, who was my girlfriend, who later was to become my wife, but at this time was my girlfriend. Marie was raised in a very strict uh, Roman Catholic home, like many of us. And her mama was very, is, was very devoted and all, and, and loves her kids. And Marie tells me she can still remember when her mom would come in sometimes after coming to church, going to church, and because Mama would go at night sometimes and Marie would be in bed, she said, I would feel the sprinkling and I'd open my eyes and my mom had brought holy water from church and was putting it on me when I was asleep. Her mama is very, very devout in the Roman Catholic faith. She was not real happy with me hooking up with her Saint Marie. She, she did not like that. <laughs> So Marie got saved and began going to church with me. And again, Mama was not real happy about that. And, and one day, Marie, out of her own volition, she chose this on her own, which I agreed with 100%. Marie said to me, I want to be water baptized. And I said, well, that's good. You need to be, of course. 
a follower of Christ. So she said, uh, I'll get baptized at this particular church that had an evening service and a baptism. So I said, let's go. So we went. Marie steps into the water and she gets soaking wet. And she comes out, her hair is real wet, obviously. And so she changes, but her hair hasn't dried. And I'm driving her home. And so we pull up in the driveway and, and she says, you know, my mom's not going to be real happy right now. And I said, yeah, I know. Do you want me to go with you into the house? She says, no. I said, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> and Marie went in and she got the lecture and the anger and everything that would have been expected. I baptized you as a baby. What are you doing? Don't you think our faith is enough? The whole thing. Sometimes your, your whole family is rejecting of you. Many of you have experienced that. Many have. You come to faith in Christ. We had a young man who got saved in this fellowship years ago now, but he got saved. The mother called us and was angry. I could handle my son when he was a druggie. I can't handle him as a Jesus freak. So they get upset. Your own family can get angry at you. I have a, a memory. I, when I went to Biola uh, College, a professor who was a uh, missionary to, to, in, to India had uh, given us a chapel service. And I'll never forget part of his message where he said that he had been raised in India and had learned uh, the, the, the dialect of his region and uh, grew to the age of becoming a pastor over a small fellowship in this Indian village. And he spoke to us about how that a young man had approached him and asked him questions about Christ. And as he was speaking to this young man about Jesus, the young man was listening attentively to the point where the missionary said to him, would you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior? The young man said to him, you don't know what it will cost me to give my heart to Jesus Christ. And so the missionary says to him, well, it's going to cost. And he starts speaking of the cost of discipleship. And after sharing, sharing these things, the, this uh, missionary in, in chapel said, so I spoke these things. But the young man said to me, you really don't understand what this is going to cost me. And the missionary said, I'm sure you're right. I don't understand. But the offer is still before you. Would you receive Christ? Do you desire him as your Messiah? And the young man said, I will pray with you and receive Christ. Three days later, I believe it was three days later, there was a knock on the pastor's door and some village police came and said, we need you to go with us. So this pastor climbed into the, uh, the car and drove him to a to a, um, uh, a road, a dirt road outside the village. And, uh, and he steps out and he sees a tarp on the side of the road. And they say, we need you to come. And we want you to identify somebody for us. We think you may know him. He said to us, so I walk up to this tarp. And it's obviously outlining a, or over a body. He said, they removed the tarp as I was looking down. And I beheld the face of the young man who had come into my office just a few days before and his head had been severed from his body. He had been beheaded. And he said, the voice of this young man rang in my ears when, when he had said, you don't know what it will cost me to follow your savior, Jesus. And he said, oh, well, it cost. He said, I did not know what it would cost. It cost him his life because his family were rabidly uh, religious in the particular faith that they had held to. And him coming to faith in Christ was the death penalty. And that's what the young man was saying. And he said, as I was looking into the face of this young man who had spoken with me just three days before, I heard the voice of the Spirit say to me very clearly, do you believe what you told him is true? Because if you don't believe that, you just killed this young man. See, your faith in Christ matters. And even your own family may reject you. This young man lost his life for believing in Jesus Christ. Jesus said, this is going to happen. It even happens in our day. It will increase during the tribulation. 
brother will betray brother to death and a father his child. It's going to come from your own family. Sometimes our family rejects us because of the Lord. In Psalm 41, verse 9, even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. In Psalm 27, 10, when my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Losing family over your faith is something that does occur. It's one of those things that makes belonging to a church family so important. In Mark 10, 29 and 30, I truly tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and fields, along with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. This increases during the tribulation. And finally, he goes on, you will be hated by all men on my account. Society itself will hate believers. When you speak the truth, you will be persecuted. You will be persecuted verbally. You will be persecuted physically. In John 15, 18, it says, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Now, he says to us, though, in verse 13, he says, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. The word endure means to hold fast or to bear up. It speaks of persevering under great trial. Now, this isn't a promise to those who believe in him will not be killed. Because according to Luke 21, 16, it says there, you will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, relatives and friends. They will put some of you to death. What he's saying is true faith will be evidenced by holding fast to the very end. Salvation is not simply for the here and now. Salvation is for eternity. Endurance does not produce salvation, but endurance is the evidence of its reality. There are those who seem to begin well, but they fade and don't remain. Enduring, persevering, is a demonstration that you actually have been changed. Like when my brother was saying to me, I've seen you go through so many fads. This is just another one of them, David. And that's been uh, demonstrated to be not true for almost 52 years since I came to faith in, in Christ. No, I endure. Why? Because he is good. He keeps us and his Holy Spirit empowers us, and we've been sealed into the day of redemption, and my God is working in us. It is a demonstration that you know Jesus Christ. There will be times that you are struggling, and there will be times, undoubtedly, that we stumble. But even when we stumble, we get up and continue forward. Why? Because our God is able to make us to stand, and we stand in him. That's how it works. So the gospel goes forth in this world. We stand up and speak the truth. People don't always like to hear it, but we give it because it is true. Righteousness is confrontational. People don't want to hear it, and some don't even preach it. One last thing, we were invited to a, a meeting in, in the local area, and it was an issue related to um, homosexuality, and there was a bill that was before... Uh, 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 the assembly that was going to be voted on, and they wanted to hear from the religious, quote-unquote, leaders of the community, and they invited all kinds of people. I was invited. So when I was part of this meeting, and so many were speaking and sharing and all, I was one of the very last, because I always wait to the end, and I waited, and I finally said, you know, homosexuality in Scripture is demonstrated to be a sin. It's not the only sin, but it is a sin, and those who practice it will not enter into the kingdom of God. But the gospel tells us that God, through his powerful Holy Spirit, can transform lives. And I said, my sister, who was captive to that philosophy and lived that life for many years, came to faith in Jesus Christ, and she's walking with the Lord. And I shared about how God can transform you. Why? Because the word of God is true. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And God can transform your life. There's not a sin he cannot forgive. And I shared that. And then this pastor sitting behind me, a couple, two or three people over, he, he raised his hand to speak. And he said, he said, homosexuality is not a big deal. It's only mentioned in scripture four times. When he said that, I couldn't hold myself back. And I turned around and I looked at him 
And I said, how many times does God have to tell you something until you listen? He says it once and that's all there is to it. That's a fact. That's a fact. How many times? You see, my own, my own father, if my dad said clean up the room once, you better clean it up. Because if I didn't clean it up when he said it once, then I would pay the price. So if my dad's word was true, why not God's word? And so the gospel should be preached. Do people like it? No. Will persecution ensue? Yes. Hold fast. Don't be surprised. Hold on to Jesus Christ because one day you will hear the words, well done, my good, my faithful servant. And that's all that matters. Never forget that. Brethren, be even more diligent to make your calling and election sure for if you do these things, you will never stumble. Second Peter 1 verse 2. Hold fast. Father, we bless you.